Hollywood goes open source and teams up with the Linux Foundation. Are our penguins learning? Educational Linux distribution Edubuntu has been discontinued. Blender brings the bench a very long and not particularly visually appealing one at that. And the 4.18 kernel is out. Hardware support abounds. Black Magic has released DaVinci Resolve 15 now with this wacky thing called working audio support. It's a thing and Dropbox has embraced EXT4 above all others. Surprisingly, some people have a problem with this question mark. It doesn't matter because it's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we take that midweek break and... Hang on, can, can I poke at him? There we go. I'm poking at him. Look at that. <laughs> to sit back, relax, and talk about some of the fun things going on in Linux, open source, floss, however you want to do it. Vin Stone, that's Joel Bryant. And over there, way over there, which I can't reach, that's uh, Pedro Mateus. Hello. Joining us live uh, with you at home. First time watching this. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. But... Um, <laughs> Before we get started, we do do a little bit of quick catch up. Jill, have you finally resolved that massive crushing hangover? <laughs> ben, oh no, yes, yeah. Uh, I wasn't gonna go there, but <laughs> okay, okay. So I went to Big Day today in LA last Saturday and passed out more Linux Gamecast flyers and had really good conversations about gaming on Linux with with all the peoples, including a lot of the uh, uh, scale people. And afterwards, we had another big uh, Linux Gamecast party at Strider's house. And that was <laughs> a lot of fun. And yes, I, I think I did get a little hangover, but that's not like me. So. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with you, Pedro? And over here, I have LEDs, purple LEDs. It, it's get the Molex power thingy on the other end, so I can't show it to you right now. But uh, no, these are going inside the... Um, uh, Steambox 360, and uh, yeah, I'm just uh, waiting for the end of the month so I can uh, feel all right with myself at spending another 100 pounds on the motherboard so I know exactly where to cut the rest of it, and I can actually fix all, uh, or I can actually finish uh, the all the holes and everything else, and I can paint the outside shell and everything else, so yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah, <laughs> Seems like a plan. Pretty. Oh, no, it's going to be ghastly i look forward to it myself um let's see nothing i'm really going to talk about but i bought myself something for me uh for the first time since i think i bought a car four years ago um i'll talk about it if it works because this was a decided thing about uh looking at something going hmm i think i can make this do something it's not supposed to and i kind of want it so yeah this is a pass fail i'm only going to report my uh, successes and no one will know about the failures if it immediately goes back um how about we get right into it let's talk about something that Sound. yeah that's right man black magic they've announced davinci resolve 15 it is out it is shipping and you can install it uh they i just kind of decided to check on a whim and the beta for this had came out a little while back I just put that in. It's like, does this thing work now? Now the audio works. That's great. It pumps it out through Alsa. It's a solid piece of kit. Uh, Jill, you had some thoughts about this. Uh, if people don't know what DaVinci is, I mean, it is a pro level video editor, but it's got some extra features. Oh, yes. And actually, um, the, uh, the what's really amazing about this release is they has, have integrated all their software into one application. So if you, 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 the DaVinci Resolve 15 Studio, not only does video and audio editing and color correction, but it also does motion graphics, 3D compositing, and visual, visual effects, and can do multi-user collaboration. And this is exactly what we've, we've wanted for years from Adobe, the Adobe Creative Suite. And, and it's only two ninety nine for the <laughs> professional ones, and it does all this stuff. And wait, wait, um, wait! You're saying it's two ninety nine, yeah. so that that's just for the taste, though, right? I got to give them some more money later, right? Well, yeah, I, I they do have the hardware editing that goes with it, but you don't have to use those. So. That's right. That is one good thing yeah. you're going to say about Black Magic. This is a one time, one time deal. You can get it for absolutely mm -hmm. free, and it's got a ton of plugins for post production and stuff like that. But the completely free version, which you can use for professional work, and it's not entirely crippled. 
So I plan on playing around with some of the post audio stuff that it's capable of. And as Jill said, I mean, it's got his animation package and a bunch of other stuff in there. If you're going to play with it on Linux, this was the first thing I saw just a bunch of people screeching about it was it's like, it doesn't work with my MP4s. No, it doesn't. Not on Linux, but you can use FFmpeg and just convert it out to ProRes on a large hard drive because mm. that is going to get big. It's going to get nasty and it's going to work just fine. But yeah, man, no uh, annual subscriptions. Uh, no online exactly. connectivity is needed to run this after you uh, purchase after it. After you yeah. activate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I think it's fair to point out that if you're on a Deb system, uh, Debian, Kubuntu, or all the other various spins, there's a handy little package that you can download the installer, get this, and it'll create a nice little installer for you. So that's right. the thing. Pedro, uh, are, are you happy, excited about this or not? <laughs> it's uh, video editing. That is your department. I will uh, <laughs> probably, I will have to learn it at some point, but not yet. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be an excellent live stream. <laughs> of people Aww. shouting at me, no, you're doing it wrong. Yes. And Chief Among yes. those voices, yours. No, I'm just yeah. going to tell you how to do the stuff wrong so the people will shout at you harder. Um, da Vinci, unlike a lot of stuff, it is more friendly than a used, used uh, coiled rattlesnake. You can play oh, with yeah. it. Pick it up and get some stuff done just by going, hmm, this should work like this. Hmm. But it's also very powerful. So go check that out. I recommend it a lot more than I recommend their hardware. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you want to pay 400 pounds for a knob? Oh. <laughs> Too easy. Let's talk about Hollywood and going open source. Oh, boy. So this is a very exciting piece of news for me. Um of course, um, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, best known for the Oscars award ceremonies, has featured, teamed up with the Linux Foundation to launch the Academy Software Foundation. And their goal is to promote, advance, and advocate for the use of open source software in the film, television, and gaming industry. And that includes helping uh, companies with the, the correct open source li licensing, collaboration, uh, using uh, GitHub and GitLab. So it's it's really been needed um, in the industry. And, um, you know, the industry has been dominated by open source software and Linux for many, many years. And finally, the likes of Variety Magazine are talking about it. So this is, yeah. this is really, really amazing. And um, it's going to definitely... Um, will help innovate progress in the right direction in the industry. And it's about time. <laughs> yeah. And if yeah. we actually start seeing some more of this, I may actually be persuaded to buy some movie tickets more often because I haven't lately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you just yeah. have hurt my brain, man? I mean, what? <laughs> I, do you, you watch movies based on the, the amount of open source technology built into the... Um, no, I watch movies <laughs> if they're convenient and they're cheap, like Netflix. Um, if I have to go out of the house, which is inconvenient for me because I'm a shut-in, uh, and if I have to pay a lot of money for a uh, movie ticket, yeah, I want to know that at least that there's doing something I agree with with my money mm. instead of just exploiting the people working at the back to push out the billion-dollar <laughs> movie. I think it's good. This is good to see. Yeah. Um, nothing but good yeah. news. Uh, Blender. Yep. It's got a benchmark. Yes. Yes, it does. Uh, it's a, a new benchmark. It doesn't really show you what it's doing. It You just have to take the teeny tiny window that it spawns uh, at its word. But it is a benchmark. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the post, the introduction post that uh, Blender put up, they actually describe. It's like, yeah, you have the... The benchmark client and it has it logs you into your blender id if you have one if not you could just run it uh and it, then it sends that uh data if you'd like to their servers to aggregate it into those neat little pastel looking graphics that ven is showing you there seriously darwin <laughs> that that's yeah, darwin <laughs> yeah <laughs> os10 yes <laughs> 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 it's the kernel, uh, whatever. Um, the um, yeah, they're aggregating all the uh, all the data to make sure that uh, everything they 
you know, okay, get that's the most- even funnier. Fifty three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Blender. People aren't using Blender on Windows. They're running a pirated version of something else. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, no. They have uh, they have put a lot of work, and they want to um, improve on the benchmark. So if you do send the uh, the data back to them, they will do their best. They have the eight principles of open data described there, and. They will do their damnedest to uh, protect your privacy, so they claim. So, yeah, no, it's I read it. It uh, took like, oh, was it 16 minutes or something to finish for the full thing? Hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's a really really good Pedro. I, I I ran it on many of my systems, and that was just awesome. Um, I thought what was cool about it is that. It's an easy to use standalone app and includes a copy of Blender in the tar archi- archive with with the the files. So you can do your own rendering within Blender itself as well. And of course, you can't do that with proprietary animation software. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I actually ran both the GPU compute and CPU benchmarks on several of my uh, render workstations. And uh, the CUDA GPU and OpenCL. GPU benchmarks were amazing. Um, I have an AMD Fire Pro with 32 gigs of RAM on, RAM on it, and it killed everything. It, it, it killed my <laughs> GTX 1060, which of course is not a render card, but I do need to uh, use it against my NVIDIA Quadro cards and, yeah. and see what those results are. But none of my NVIDIA Quadro cards have 32 gigs of RAM on them. <laughs> and so. Speaking of results, the interesting <laughs> bit was, well, it, it's interesting, but it won't really surprise anyone. The fastest CPU, it's the Epic 32-core, 64-thread processor. Yeah. The fastest <laughs> compute device uh, is CUDA. Duh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, no, it's really unsurprising. But uh, the one thing that kind of sort of shocked me was that you have... Um, OpenCL has a smaller margin between uh, itself and the CPU benchmark than CUDA does with OpenCL. It's yes. like CUDA is so much faster. Yeah. Damn. I think it's pretty interesting. It's self-contained. Download it, run it. You can do the CPU, GPU. I ran the CPU. I was like, all right, that's the thing. And this is nothing new if you've been using Blender for a while. I mean, even our forums, we've had bench offs using CPU, GPU, but it does have, uh, I kind of wish it would give you more visual feedback as to what it's mm-hmm. doing. It, it has a state of not running and running. That That's really yeah. good going on. Yeah. It's like, are the fans on? Okay, it's running. Cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's going to check the temps. It's like, oh, getting towards 75. Yep. All right. Um, that's the thing. It's kind of brilliant. So uh, education and Linux and distributions and rest in peace. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, what's sad about this is the educational Linux distribution Edubuntu has been discontinued, and it's it's really, really, um, actually, real, very sad. Um, uh, unfortunately, no one stepped up to the plate for um, to develop it, and um, you can still download and use it, but it's only going to be uh, uh, supported till next year because it's based off fourteen oh four point five LTS. And um, uh, that's just, yeah, it's, it, it was actually one of the most used educational uh, distros on the market, but there are plenty of others. And actually one of them, uh, Ubermix, is a lightweight educational Linux distro aimed at older hardware that is the most used now and has taken the place really, or really of the heavier Edubuntu. That was the big complaint about Edubuntu is that it was heavier. And most of the people that want educational distros are using it on older hardware, such as kids on computers, using to teach computers and Linux to kids in developing countries. They're using old hardware. So they need um, an educational distro that's lightweight, like Ubermix or Anti-X or Raspbian for the Raspberry Pi, for that matter. So, um, but yeah, uh, like, like Ven said in the notes, uh, you can use any distro to teach Linux, of course. <laughs> well, we all know the best. I mean, if you're going to be teaching anything, it's Arch. Uh, 100%. <laughs> I'm only half joking. I mean, seriously, for like fun yeah. and general knowledge, Arch is a great distribution for that. If you want to get ready for like future employment, get Fedora. 
that's going to be your friend. Uh, mm-hmm. what, what do you use as an educational distro, Pedro? Uh, the laptop that I usually carry around with me, the ThinkPad X240, it runs Fedora. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for- Fedora, yeah, Debian, I, Slackware. Yeah, on this <laughs> box, I, I use Solus. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, uh, for carrying around with me, I take something that I know that if it breaks, I'll at least have a chance of fixing it unless I had something to do with it, at which point it's just might as well reload it. it it's, it's broken. <laughs> <laughs> There's beautiful things like Ubuntu Server and don't, not even one kids. Uh, we've, we've already got somebody. Let's say Katana's already with Gen 2, and we got uh, Sent and yeah, Open Susie, oh, I guess. For Dante, for Dante 14.6 on that CD. Good, good find mm-hmm. there, Free Jack. That could be a thing. So, uh, free tools to check for critical open source vulner- vulnerabilities. Learn to English, old man. Uh, good idea, bad idea, sideways idea. It's we- not a terrible idea. So, um, basically, what they. Uh, What's it called? Uh, they had the CLI, the bit, the bit. Yeah, the guys um, behind White Source uh, put out a free tool, and what they just call it the vulnerability checker. And what it does is it does a very high level scan of you point it at um, your website, your server, whatever, and it does a very high level check and says, okay, these are the uh, known vulnerabilities. This is what you need to look out for. This is what you need to do to fix it. And for a a high level thing, if you just want to poke at something to see how it reacts, that's not terrible. But if you're using just this as your sole security tool, uh, yeah, no, you're still screwed very very badly (laughs) yeah um i you know i actually like the idea of this but it reminds me a little too much of running a virus checker on windows (laughs) so so (laughs) malware bytes anti-malware or something um but (laughs) but um actually you know like like you were saying pedro um you know most administrators are you know they're keeping up on their updates and whatnot and that's really the key here Uh, just just keep it up, keep things updated. <laughs> so, you know, this is, but this is good for, you know, especially, uh, um, you know, web devs and whatnot who want to, you know, just quickly say, okay, what, 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 what are the issues with my system? <laughs> yeah. It's good to see. Good piece of kit. And it's probably never going to hurt. I don't know how often it throws false positives, <laughs> but that could be a thing. It is summertime for Pedro's favorite distribution, <laughs> which is Solus because ships, they have no souls. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they do have a little bit of soul, uh, even if Ike has decided to uh, take a sabbatical. Good for him. Uh, this Nine is uh... nails. <laughs> what is this quake? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's the uh, the little media player that they have. Uh, it uh, it's to show the integrated functionality that they have with the Raven panel. Uh, that has a little slidey thing down the side, like Windows 10 does, but that seems to be the future. So we'll go with mm-hmm. that. It's, uh, yeah, they introduced a lot of uh, new tools for developers, including uh, the dependency hell ameliorator EOPKG Depths and the tool which actually makes use of it, Kappa. Uh, what it does is it keeps track of the uh, upstream projects, and with the help of EOPKG Depths, it ensures that everything that it depends on is kosher and all the dependencies will be pulled if necessary. If not, it'll just make the necessary changes to the OPKGs to say, no, this uh, this package provides uh, that particular dependency. Uh, they also have improvements on uh, Budgie, though my biggest complaint with Budgie is still very much there. It relies on Mutter. It can only use Mutter because GTK3, GTK3, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's all it can use uh, if you try to say forcibly crash it and then run Compton on top of it, it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's why on Solus I will stick to KDE because as good as Budgie is and as good as an improvement as it is over GNOME 3, in my opinion, it is uh, still very, very limited. They do say with Budgie 11, they're looking to change uh, how the window manager does compositing. Yes, please do, because Mutter makes Kwin mm-hmm. look competent. 
Okay. Uh, so that's got a couple of neat things yeah. like the caffeine thing. Um, screen dimmer, anti screen dimmer. That's a nice little thing to have in there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm digging that. And don't they do like a monthly thing with the, uh, like a code gem? Is that a regular? The hack, yes. Hack fest. Yep. Yeah. The hack fest. Hack fest. Yeah. 10 hours of content. Feel free to, yeah, the video's on there. Go check that out. I mean, it's come a long way. So, yeah. If, yeah. And yeah. So, you know, Ike, you know, bringing, bringing, um, Budgie back into the realm of, uh, uh Solace has been really a good thing. Uh, look at all mm -hmm. the improvements they've been able to do to Budgie because they've brought it back into the fold. So, mm. yeah. So good news, everyone. Dropbox. Dropping Dropbox. Show title. Um, they write, hey, everyone. November 7th, 2018, we're ending support for Dropbox syncing to drives with certain uncommon file systems. The supported file systems will be NTFS for Windows, HFS or APFS for Mac, and EXT4 for, for Linux. Uh, if you don't run those, you can eat a bag. They don't say that, yeah. but that is kind of what you're getting from this uh is this a good thing this is a bad thing should should we grab the pitchforks i mean yeah. what's going on here yeah to me this is a bad thing because uh people are businesses using encrypted ext4 which is a very popular widely used uh, file system in their workflow um th that's definitely problematic for them to have to switch over to ext4 and but of course most people are under Linux are using ext4 and that is the a default under Ubuntu so this won't affect them and you can always use the web client instead of the standalone app but that isn't as convenient for for backing up large amounts of data or you could be like me and Vin and just use Google Drive <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah it's yeah I guess there's a a reasoning behind this, although why they were actively supporting and considering changes for all of those other file systems, especially on Linux, yeah. is beyond me. Because I know for a fact that there's a uh, Portuguese ISP, Mel, that offers a cloud client. It used to be that they offered 16 gigs for free to everyone who signed up. Now you only get five, or unless um, unless you're uh, one of their clients, at which point you get 25 gigs of um, free storage. Uh, and that particular cloud application only had one issue, which was F2FS just wouldn't work. Hmm. It would claim that it hmm. was trying to sync and it hmm. would throw errors left and right, so it wouldn't actually write anything. But it worked on everything else, and they... Actually, most of the command line interface um, for that is open source. So you could just go have a look at it. They did nothing special to support all the other file systems. So what were mm. Dropbox doing exactly? Yeah. Doing their own thing, apparently. But hey, some people really like Dropbox. I don't want to see somebody using Dropbox and like, wow, that's a blast from them. I mean, it's not as bad as like, you really have real player still installed? Um, <laughs> I use Google Drive, but I also use um, Amazon Glacier because yeah. I've set that account up for like our old cold storage videos that sit there and it's like, hey, man, I can use this for everything else because it's wicked cheap to store stuff as long as no one uses it. Um, so roll your own. And that's what I do with Google. I give Google like a stupid little amount of money and I have a gang of storage for uh, show notes and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised they didn't do like ext4 and maybe BTRFS. Yeah, yeah. I was BTRFS has no adoption though. It's yeah, but... ext4, baby, xfs, yeah, and XFS that's it. Is, is actually widely used. So <laughs> uh, we we look forward to your feedback on that particular <laughs> note next week, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Linux is in desperate need of two things: that's first-person <laughs> shooters and podcast clients. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So uh, in that spirit, someone decided, you know what, let's make a new podcast app. Uh, but it's not actually a new podcast app. It's just a, a podcast playing functionality added to the uh, GDK spectrum. Uh, it's called Gnome Podcasts or just Podcasts. And it's um, it's very, very bare bones, very, very simple. Uh, you can subscribe, uh, you can uh, filter by the new ones, you can go and browse through all the uh, the feeds that you're subscribed to. You can do all of that, but it's 
it's a thing that plays audio from an RSS feed. I have this really great um, podcasting uh, appli- uh, playing application <laughs> that I use on my uh, on my desktop whenever I'm doing stuff. Is it called your uh, imagination? No, it's called VLC. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I actually yeah, was another one. pretty happy. Yeah, I was pretty happy about this actually, because uh, podcasting li- li- listenership is increasing, and it's nice to see a new standalone app in the, in this space, other than uh, G Potter. And uh, G Potter, I love too, and I I had used that for years, but I'm going to try this one for a while. And I enjoy having a separate app for all my Linux podcast feeds because I listen to so many, and that that's what's nice about this. Everything's contained in one place. And of course, this is yet another way to listen to LWW, LG, LGC RSS feeds. So that makes me happy. <laughs> we should point out two things. One, this is available on Flathub. So yes. installing it is just a snap. Yes. And it's not an uh-huh. Electron app. <laughs> and uh, I want to make a point that it is compatible with the iTunes podcast directory. So yeah. All right. It's mm-hmm. Got that going forward. Go check it out. Um, I'm old stuff. I just couldn't I know it's been over half a decade since I've used a desktop client mm-hmm. simply because Android exists. And if Android yeah. didn't exist, I would still use my desktop stuff because it used to be Amarok. All the things. Yeah. That monstrous <laughs> program. Um it fell out. Uh, it fell out of grace with the KDE community for some reason. Hmm. Well, <laughs> it, it, it has a spiritual successor, though, right? Something Clementine. Like Clementine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That became a very large program. Pedro, four eighteen is here, and it's steamy. Oh yes, uh, Linux four eighteen new kernel release, and uh, there's a bunch of new stuff. Uh, the a bunch of uh, improvements that were added, some of which include the support for the, oh, well, they already had support for the AMD RX Vega M, but this actually introduces some functionality. Uh, if you don't know, the AMD Radeon RX Vega M is the one that comes included with the hybrid uh, Lake G um, CPU that Intel makes. So you can now have that particular monstrosity running on your Linuxes. You're probably not going to be playing games anytime soon, but at least it will show things accordingly. Uh, You can also, uh, the 418 version also introduces complete support for the Raspberry Pi 3B and 3B+. So everything is fully supported now. No more uh, need for patches or downloading one of the unofficial, quote-unquote, kernels um mm-hmm. they also reverse uh they added a reverse engineered steam controller driver to to the linux kernel proper to allow the steam controller to have its uh keyboard and mouse functionality mm-hmm. in, without the need to install steam or sc controller so that's good that's yeah. very good mm-hmm. awesome <laughs> as we find out sometimes that that then things get interesting because then the long running joke of making me switch a show as a Patreon goal using the thing with the Steam controller with OBS, <laughs> which is possible. It would yeah. just be a nightmare. Um, it's one step closer, but that's good because you'll be able to use your Steam controller, especially if you're playing the thousand yard. I'm over here on my couch and I don't want to have you mm-hmm. use a wireless gerbo in a keyboard. Steam controller is your best friend. If you just have one for a home yep. theater PC, it's worth the investment for that alone. Um, I'm glad that's there at 418. I'm not brave enough. I'm not, I, I'll play with it 417. I'm fighting with right now with the video devices and it duplicating them for some reason. So I'm still back on this archaic 415 because it does this little thing I called working. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, what are your thoughts? Oh, I was really happy about all the updates, um, especially also to the um, improving the ARM support on, on laptops, like for Chromebooks and whatnot. So that's mm-hmm. really cool. And then, like you said, having the Ariella controller with more support under Linux, uh, that's everything's good about that. <laughs> oh, and uh, one thing I forgot, uh, they are now, um, they have another mitigation in place for uh, Y2K V2.0, which will happen in January 19th, uh, oh, 2038 yeah, yeah mm-hmm. the year 2038 bug when it uh, because for some reason uh, the way that uh, clocks work nowadays 
or the way that it has been implemented in the uh, Linux kernel, it has been counting all the seconds since 1970. Uh, so <laughs> when it reaches January 19th, 2038 at like 11 in the morning, it will run out of seconds on the 32-bit integer variable that it's being stored on. So it mm. will crash and the world will burn. Do you think we'll get like a new silver chair song though? <laughs> <laughs> anyway that's the thing pedro you love your chromebooks i mean you love one so much that like last week you held one in your lap please do not pull one out there it is of course he's got one sitting in his lap anytime nori really gets upset about that but oh. <laughs> this is from xda developers all this business in our show notes chromebooks may get apple bootcamp like windows 10 dual booting the little thing not called love it's called campfire yeah, so uh, if you have a, apparently this is going to be a thing, especially with Pixel Books, this is going to be rolling out. This is not going to work with ARM, even though there's versions of Windows 10 that boots on ARM. No one wants to run, run Windows on ARM, even Microsoft. Yeah, they, they tried, <laughs> man. Uh, like some of the thoughts behind this, I mean, this is going to work like boot again. I mean, if you have an extra, I don't know, what, like 40 gigs laying around and a Chromebook capable of running this, they're, they're going to be kind of selective about what this is going to roll out on is like, well, that's not being totally stupid. So, okay, you got that going for you. And it, oh, no, this is just bad. I don't, I don't even want to cover this, man. <laughs> yeah. um, I, the it, ability to run Windows. Why would you want to do that? Let me tell yeah. you why. <laughs> let me tell you why. I'm going to sell this to you. So okay. they, they point out in this article on XDA, they say, to continue using devices safely beyond Google's arbitrary 6.5-year EOL milestone. That rings yeah. a little hollow because we're talking about usually some pretty cheap pieces of equipment with sealed batteries that you would have to destroy in order to even replace that. So if you get six years out of it, you're doing good. <laughs> Chromebooks. Chromebooks are meant was like, oh, that one broke. All right, next. They're clone books. Yeah, and when they break, yeah. let's say you sideload a distribution without relying on Crouton, because Crouton works great. Mm -hmm. Make no mistake, it works great. But uh, let's say you wanted some actual bootcamp type functionality where you could just side boot a different operating system. But instead of Windows, having that functionality be with Linux. Mm. That yeah. would be nice. That would, that would be, be very awesome. nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just I just don't see the point of this. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Still> <laughs> Windows 10 on a Chromebook? I mean, as they even mentioned in the article, of course, you can't even put Windows 10 on a Chromebook unless it's a more powerful one. And, and mm -hmm. most of the people out there using Chromebooks are using the cheap, you know, $250 to, to $400 ones. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, yeah. it perplexes me because <laughs> yeah. the one thing I could say about Chrome OS was when you get a power wash. It's like it it's a computer for regular people who don't want to worry about running antiviruses or anything else. And it's like, oh, you broke it. Yeah. Fix it real quick. Hold that down. All right, log back into your Google account. Done. It yeah. did that very well. It's like tap the brakes. Cause don't mm -hmm. don't try to be everything. Don't don't get all Akira on us <laughs> and just turn into that blob. So we need to get into a slice of pie before we do that. We want to thank the lovely people uh, as we do each and every week. Pedro, do we have anybody that showed us a little bit extra love this week? Oh, yes. Yes, we did. Uh, System T has up their pledge. Thank you. Yay. Thank you very much. Uh, System T is one of our 117 Patreons. Oh, nope. Sorry. It dropped a little bit. 16. Somebody. somebody. 116. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, check your credit cards, kids. That happens yeah. sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, 116 Patreons making this show possible, making all those weekly streams possible. And for those of uh, those of you out there who decide we're worth the extra couple of uh, dollars every week, uh, you also get access to the pre pre super shows and, and earlier access because early access is a tainted term now uh to the stuff of what we do one thing about the pre pre super shows and because calling it a show is kind of a thing if you've ever been curious about what we're up to it's a legitimate production <laughs> meeting even though it's our version of a production meeting which probably is going to involve 20 to 25 minutes of talking about what we're watching but yes. it's, if you've ever wanted to be a fly on the wall, you do get a custom RSS feed that you can plug into a podcatcher. And we've recently started doing video versions of that. If that is your thing, 
But yeah, thanks everyone for making this possible, helping us pay the bills. Uh, stick around to the end. Check out your name in the credits because mm-hmm. that's going to be a thing. So Oops. you guys want to get into this uh, slice pie? Mm. Let's see what ah. I got. Oh, that's what we got. Oh, you can't even read it. Boo. Boo. <laughs> there Negative <wait>. pie. <laughs> Look at that. It, it's like 70s. <laughs> it what trickery is this? <laughs> it's magic, man. It's magic. Uh, tell me about 10 YouTubers I should be following. Yeah. So these are our... Uh, some of the best uh, YouTube uh, Raspberry Pi and instructional uh, videos, um, all the uh, different YouTubers. And some of them I have uh, watched and some of them I haven't. So I'm going to put those on my list of, of ones to watch. But one of my favorite ones is actually Christopher Barnett's Explaining Computers. Um, it's He uh, has one of my favorite YouTube channels and he has great instructional videos, especially for the newbie. Uh, for the Raspberry Pi, Linux, and computers in general. And I often have my uh, Steve husband in chat watch them to learn about Linux and computers. That's that's a station, <laughs> a YouTuber that he's in, he enjoys. And uh, there, were, there was one on there that they, um, if you go through the links, there was one on there that they didn't list, which I was surprised about, which is the Add a Fruit videos. They put out ec- an excellent video. Um, uh, YouTube podcasts and do weekly uh, what's new uh, with uh, uh, Raspberry Pis and whatnot. So, I guess they didn't want to take up two spaces uh, shilling for themselves since they already recommended the uh, Raspberry Pi yeah. Foundation. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Jen Foxbot uh, is one that I've enjoyed watching. So she is cool. And, I, I would um, also add yeah. to this list uh, <laughs> Michael Reeves, but uh, don't have your kids in the room when you play his videos. Or oh, put yeah. some headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> I know. YouTubers with potty mouths. A <laughs> 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 um, little bit of advice. Mm-hmm. Raspberry Pi. Uh, that, this is that web, yeah, raspberrypi.org. Don't use embed to put YouTube videos up. You can get the embed code right there. You have to enable like three things with script block before that even shows up. Also, <laughs> also <laughs> tap the brakes in the animated GIFs. <laughs> no, oh yeah, no. yeah. That there's was... another one now. <laughs> yeah. <there's... laughs> and this one is uh, from uh, the Night Pie. Yes. So uh, who was it? Um, I don't know. Uh, so uh, someone decided. That just know straight what? up looks like something you'd leave in somebody's house and activate it at <laughs> night. Alex Bate, that's him. Uh, he decided, you know what? I really want some night vision goggles, but I don't have uh, six hundred to twenty-seven thousand pounds to spend uh, on a pair of them. So uh, he went looking for what could uh, serve as an adequate replacement, and they, he found a redditor, uh, MTN Biker Dunn. Montana biker done? Yeah, whatever. Uh, he uh, who had or already built something like this. And it's it's very simple. I already showed you the picture. It's uh, It's got a screen to act as the goggles proper. And it's got some purplish lights beaming out the front with, I'm guessing, a uh, slightly more light-sensitive camera. IR, and- man. Oh, it is proper IR camera? All right. Well, I don't know what I'm just saying. It's like with any night vision goggle, if you need a flashlight, just grab a remote control and then (laughs) that'll light everything. I don't think the camera that uh, they use uh, for this specific one is an IR capable one because they said that this all put together with a Raspberry Pi Zero was about 100 pounds. Okay, well, then I take it back. Just use a regular flashlight. and be true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because an IR camera and a Raspberry Pi compatible IR camera is a bit pricier than that. It's a couple of hundred pounds mm-hmm. on top of that. So, yeah. <laughs> Still a fun project. Yeah. Um, it is. Yeah. And, and, you know, these devices actually cost thousands of use, using the military and government. So this mm-hmm. is actually a really the le- least expensive option. <laughs> That's definitely the thing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, that's going to wrap us up. we got a little bit of feedback that we're going to touch on. If you want to get in touch with us, uh, I think they can just head over to linuxgamecast.com. Come on, Pedro, do your thing. Linuxgamecast.com. There he goes. Support. There we go. 
Sorry, Listen, I was distracted. Uh, I, I apologize. Was saying firmware that there, update. there are some cheap IRC CDs. Mm. Sorry, <laughs> I was just looking at the chat. Uh, yeah. LinuxGameCast.com forward slash support where you can leave your bit of feedback. Make sure to pick mm-hmm. LWDW. You haven't changed the name to Little Choosy Box yet. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, just pick LWDW in the little choosy box and uh, we will be more than happy to feature your feedback right here unless it's something that's quick enough and we can just reply to you uh, right then and there. At which point we may still feature it, but just try to come up with something that'll look good on camera. Unlike me. I mean, look at my face. Hey man, I'm going to be the first to point out that you sound a lot less red this week. (laughs) If this was uh, Saturday night on that other show, what we do, I'd have an answer for you. <laughs> Lenovo. This is from Vipor29. Um, Lenovo, we were talking about the Lenovo laptops, and pretty decent. He's like, hey, man, they've been great with supporting Linux, especially their laptops. My T520 works great with Linux. Vendors are starting to take a lot of notice, and hopefully more will jump aboard. So, yeah, think pads, man. Um, yeah, see, there, mm-hmm. there's the thing. Uh, Lenovo did good on the whole getting ThinkPads uh, supported by the um, uh, firmware upgrade, update, uh, daemon thingy. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but we talked about it last week. Yeah. And yeah, they did really good with that. Yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't go so far with the they, them having been great with supporting linux i mean remember that thing that they had on the yoga that uh, the raid driver just wouldn't let linux run at all and unlike every other laptop where you could just go into the uefi disable the raid and put it back into a hci mode they locked that option away they deliberately locked that option away did they did they sell that from the factory with linux pre-installed no (laughs) okay then moot point uh dell sells a laptop right now that the fingerprint reader doesn't work on. It even says it. It's like, oh uh, yeah, mm-hmm. if you buy it pre-configured with Linux, mm, can't, can't use the fingerprint reader. Can't deal with it. Anyway. You can get the old X240 fingerprint readers working. Take some doing, but they work. Do do you share his love of all things Lenovo, Jill, or, or do you take Pedro's side of they did something weird and wacky that one time, therefore they should be burnt <laughs> and shamed? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually agree with Pedro. Uh, their support of their <laughs> of their ThinkPads is has not been great in the past. But I mean, I, I, Linux always ran on them, but Lenovo mm-hmm. didn't necessarily support Linux running on them. So, and us Linux users, you know, the 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 um, T series of laptops is so, are some of our favorites. And um, yeah, so th- this was a huge move. Uh, this was a huge move to to. Uh, uh, supporting the uh, firmware updates was awesome. <laughs> you know that, and remember, HP, you're late. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Pedro, do you want to try to summarize this? I guess we should point out that uh, comments are now enabled on our web zone again for the first time in a couple of years, and uh, yeah. you can always leave us feedback on individual posts. So mm-hmm. uh, this is this is author. What were we talking about, man? Something about no. We uh, yeah, we were talking about that no memory leak that wasn't actually a memory leak, and then yeah. this particular person, uh, Philip Cimento, uh, he um, introduced not exactly a fix, but something that would at least improve the situation. And what he uh, that was um, it was called like big hammer the, the or big hammer. More. Yeah. yeah, big hammer. Uh, and basically, what it uh, what it did was it outright killed all of the uh, ghost processes uh, and everything else that was still holding onto the memory and not letting go long after the cleanup had already been done and the process mm-hmm. was left behind. So uh, he got the ping back finally, but <laughs> because Venry enabled comments and just like, oh, you have a ping back, uh, and so he replied uh, and he. Uh, appreciates the uh, the support, and he would just like to clarify a couple of things. The first one is that yes, he does understand that that is not a fix, but it was a good enough workaround something uh, that they felt comfortable enough to include it with the upcoming uh, GNOME three point thirty 
Uh, so, and the fact that uh, saying that the problem is um, isn't a memory leak is in no way meant to uh, sort of minimize the impact that those zombie processes were uh, leaving behind because that was very much an issue and people were complaining about it and people were running out of RAM and stuff was crashing. Of course it wasn't. So it's just something else differently. It's not a memory leak per se. It's just memory that's not being properly cleaned up. So yeah, thanks for getting back to us, Philip. (laughs) Appreciate it. (laughs) Yeah, we called it the garbage collector. I remember from yep. the, our, our, yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and one of the remember. reasons why I don't use gnome. <laughs> so. Why you got you? You hate gnome. All you no. Oh yeah, that one doesn't trust it. You, Jill. Uh, he says that yeah. uh, if that's the only thing keeping you from using gnome, you can use it now, you guys. Oh, I know, I know, <laughs> and I and I'm I'm being a little facetious. I actually um I actually do like gnome, and I love uh, the Pop OS um, implementation of gnome, and um. We just we just have fun with it, but I actually do 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 use it. <laughs> oh, you can speak for yourself. Happy twenty first birthday, <laughs> Gnome Project. <laughs> I saw that they posted awesome. that, and I was like, okay, so it's twenty one years of using Gnome to install something else. Got it. Uh, <laughs> it's Linux. Use what you want. We got bigger wars to fight. No one cares what desktop manager you're on. Run what yeah. works for you at the end of the day. Exactly. You don't like what I run? That's fine. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. You should do the same thing. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to close it out. We're going to bring up some music and play some credits because uh, it's been fun. It's been real, and it has been another great day for Linux. We'll see you next week. Ooh. Ominous. <laughs> it's a threat, man. That's a promise. <laughs> a promise threat. A promise. Sounds like a thermos, but it's not, because this guy's full of promises. <laughs> Sounds like a thermos. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> the emphasis is in, is in the completely wrong syllable, but sure, whatever. <laughs> ah. Gnome... Sorry, GNOME is the pinnacle of computing. See, Pedro, you really shouldn't that. you really shouldn't <laughs> talk smack and just like stumble like that when you start back out of the game. Aww. It's not flattering. <laughs> Bye everyone. I'm here to flatter myself. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye everyone. <laughs>